Peace, family. It's your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. You're watching the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel. I normally don't do commentaries on Saturday afternoon, but I had to. Uh, as you know, I have been absolutely fascinated uh, by the tension, the debate, the disagreement between Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro, not because I care about the personal pieces of it, uh, but because I'm actually thinking that it's a referendum in a lot of ways about, or a referendum on media, the status of media, the status of free speech, the status of acceptable discourse on Israel-Palestine. There's a series uh, of reasons that I think it makes sense uh, to talk about this issue. <clears throat> and for those that don't know, and I've posted earlier videos and had other commentaries about this, Candace Owens departed from the Daily Wire a week ago now. And when Candace uh, left the Daily Wire, there was a uh, considerable, considerable uh, discord between Ben Shapiro, who is a host on the, the network and also a co-founder and certainly an influential person, although he's not in a hiring or firing position, and Candace Owens. This uh, began most recently after October 7th, when Candace Owens began to speak out uh, against or have a, a, a different position than Ben Shapiro and really than the network on Israel-Palestine, specifically about whether Israel was committing genocide. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only issue here. Candace Owens has gotten into intense back and forths with Rabbi Shmuley. Uh, <clears throat> she has gotten into uh, public or she's caught public controversy because she continues to stand next to and befriend Kanye West, who has been deemed anti-Semitic, uh, a claim that I agree with. I think Kanye is anti-Semitic as well. And in the midst of all of this, Candace Owens is still growing as a right-wing star. She's one of the most uh, visible and important, powerful, certainly, voices on the right and among Black Republicans. I don't think there's anybody even close right now. So this is all the backdrop of what's going on. <clears throat> After it was announced that Candace had left the Daily Wire, and it was a very, uh, I would say, simple, uh, basic departure. And by simple and basic, I mean there was no big press conference. There was no, there was no big outcry. We had seen um, the signs, uh, for sure. We had seen the signs. Um, Candace, Ben was saying things about Candace. Candace was doing her best not to respond, uh, not to go back and forth. And then Candace went on Joe Budden's show, and then she went on uh, The Breakfast Club, two major black uh, media platforms. And when she was on The Breakfast Club, uh, the last one of the things she said was, Ben Shapiro doesn't have the power to fire me. Now, I'm not saying that's what got her fired, but she did get fired the next day. It could be coincidence. It could be lots of things. Earlier that week, she had gotten into an intense debate with Rabbi Michael Barclay. That also was part of the mix. But now, and this is the part that I want to talk about today, um, she comes forward, or I'm sorry, uh, Ben Shapiro comes forward. He gives an interview on Piers Morgan, which I talked about. And when he gives uh, the interview to Piers Morgan, he says, I'm not going to talk about this. And then he proceeds to explain that networks don't have, or, or, or publishers don't have a responsibility uh, to free speech to the extent that everybody doesn't have to have the same, uh, or, or, or everybody, he what Ben basically said was, if you're a platform like Twitter, Facebook, whatever, there should be a diversity of opinions. And there's diversity of opinions on Daily Wire. However, we don't have a duty to pay people, right, of, of all political ideologies and positions. That's what he said. And then that was the end of it, while continuing to say he wasn't going to talk about it. But then, just yesterday, he goes back on another platform to not talk about it. Now, the first time I'll say, look, maybe you got caught by surprise. Maybe Piers asked you a question, you did your best to be diplomatic, but you also want to be polite and forthcoming. Cool. But now you're coming forward and going on another platform. Ben Shapiro goes on another platform to not talk about it. And what he effectively does is not talk about it by talking about it, right? He, he continues to say, um, I, I can't talk about this. But then he he, he sends subtle messages uh, that Candace is wrong. Or, 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 you know, even though there was no official announcement of a firing, what they said was that they had parted ways. And yet um, 
he's effectively making it sound as if they fired her based on the conversation he had with Piers and now the conversation that he had with uh, David Rubin. Uh, these are not coincidences. Ben Shapiro is on a media tour to make sure that uh, that Candace Owens is read as an anti-Semite and that she is read as somebody who was fired rather than um, rather than uh, who just had a mutual departure. And so here's his conversation. I'm going to show you a little bit of his conversation with with uh, with the, with uh, with uh, with uh, with David Rubin, because in his conversation with David Rubin, you can really see uh, what happened. Check this out. All right, so let's do the elephant in the room for just a moment because I saw you this week on Piers Morgan. He asked you repeatedly about Candace. Uh, you repeatedly basically said- I won't talk about don't that. Want yeah, to talk I'll about say that it. here too. I, I, yeah, <laughs> and that's fine. And, and you know, it's interesting because we all sort of came up together to different extents and we've all done a million things together. And so again, he starts by saying, I told Piers I'm not going to talk about it. And I'm telling, <clears throat> I'm telling you I'm not going to talk about it. Now, if he's sincere, for those of you who do media, who are interviewers or who are guests, you know, there's a way to pivot. And as a guest, you can say, I'm not going to talk about it. The, the questioner, if they're good at their job, will follow up and ask another question. You say again, I'm not going to talk about it. You tend to move on. Or they ask a different angle of the same question, but you don't keep going. But there's no indication here based on their body language or based on the follow-up question that there's a real desire here to not keep, to not uh, continue. And you'll see that as we go. Watch. Public events and networks and all those things. It seems to me that at this moment, She's now a free agent. She happened to end up on Locals, where which I created, and we they were a platform, not a publisher that you guys are. Can you at least talk to just sort of just sort of where it's at now? She's not with you. She's free. She's and, free to do and, whatever she wants to do, and to be wherever she wants to be. And the difference between a publisher like The Daily Wire and a platform like Locals is obviously that a platform should have a very broad range of speech that it allows, including speech that maybe even the creators don't believe is inside what they would consider to be the Overton window. That's a very different thing than direct subsidization of particular opinions. Uh, the Daily Wire would not have a host, would not pay a host who was staunchly pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. They'd have no obligation to pay a host who is staunchly pro-abortion. And so when it comes to the hosts on The Daily Wire, obviously everyone is able to say what they want. Nobody ever comes to me and says, you can't say X. Nobody ever says that to Walsh. And no one ever said that to Candace. But the reality is that there is an Overton window at The Daily Wire. Obviously there was a non-meeting of the minds. That's pretty much all I can say on this. Uh, and you know, a, a lot of this has happened publicly. Uh, and the, but you know, to the extent that, that The Daily Wire is in fact not a publisher, it is a pla that, that is in fact not a platform, it is a publisher. That means that there is no moral obligation for the daily, and there's no free speech problem with the daily wire saying we don't wish to pay a particular host or that host saying I don't wish to work here anymore. Be so, a couple of things here uh, that are happening, right? First, he says uh, a couple of things that they're not exactly contradictory, but they are in a an almost irreconcilable tension. I'll put it that way. He says that um, we are a publisher, not a platform. True. We don't have a duty to pay anyone uh, for of, of, of a particular point of view. In other words, as he said, we're anti-abortion, so we're, we don't, we're not going to pay someone to have a pro-abortion show on our network. That's true. Right here on my YouTube channel, I'm not going to have someone who is pro-genocide. I'm not going to have someone who is anti-Black. I'm not going to have someone who has politics that are different than mine. That completely makes sense. He also says, and he'll say this throughout the interview, because I think he just learned this term, uh, that there is an Overton window. The Overton window is uh, a kind of framework created by a man named Joseph Overton, a political analyst. And, and, and the idea here, or theorist even, and, and the idea is that there is a range of acceptable uh, political ideologies within uh, a mainstream that range from sort of the unthinkable to what becomes flat out policy. Now, you know, some can be policy that's like clearly acceptable. It can be just popular, but not policy. It can be sensible. It can be acceptable. It can be radical or it can be unthinkable. And think about how different ideas, whether it's the abolition of prisons or whether it's the end of slavery or whether it's abortion or whether it's legalizing weed. There are all sorts of things that have had different positions in American society at different times. 
So sometimes things are within the window of discourse or the Overton window. Other times uh, they are not. If something is seen as unthinkable or radical, it's not in the realm. Uh, it, 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 but if it's sensible or popular or policy or pop, you know, now it's in the Overton window. He doesn't use the term exactly correctly, but it's close enough that y'all get the point. So this is his position. At the same time, at the same time, he's arguing that no one ever tells anybody what to say at the Daily Wire. So how do you reconcile those two things? Well, it sounds like what he's saying, based on those two points, which could be contradictory, but I don't think they are. I don't think Ben is actually con contradicting himself here. I think what he's saying is we don't hire people with, with, with certain politics because we don't believe in it. But once you're hired, we're not on a daily basis giving you editorial feedback on what to say and what not to say. That makes complete sense, right? Just like if I had a, you know, if I were to hire two podcasters right now for my channel, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't tell them what to say every day. But again, I wouldn't hire somebody who had beliefs that I feel are unethical or immoral. But here's the challenge. Here's where the contradictions start to come up. Jeremy Boring, the CEO, has said that they would never fire anybody for their political beliefs that they would never fire anybody for having a different political position. Now, he's very clearly saying, yeah, you can't have certain positions and work here. So the question is, well, what positions did Candace have that made her ineligible to work here? What was outside of the Overton window of, uh, of the Daily Wire? And if it's outside of that window, why they hire her in the first place? These are all important questions that we have to think about. These are all important questions that we have to wrestle with. And so I want everybody out there who's thinking about this stuff to ask those questions and put a pin in those questions. I want to come back to them. I want to, I want to show the rest of this video, but keep thinking about this. Why they hire her if she has uh, positions that are outside the Overton window? Keep watching. You'll see why, why I'm asking that. Because again, there's a parting of the ways that I'm, that, you know, is not really open for discussion at this point. Do, uh, does it surprise you that so many people, that even on our side question, of this, are confused about that as it relates to free speech and quote unquote cancel culture? Like severing a business tie, as long as you're not throwing someone in jail, they're able to be everywhere else, is not. Uh, I'm not super culture, surprised at the controversy, yeah. honestly, because to, to a certain extent, I think that there's been a, a reaction on the right to the excesses of the left. So, because what the left did is they said that the Overton window ought to be closed so tight that no one can get inside the Overton window. Basically, if you're to the right of Hillary Clinton, you can't be allowed inside Welcome the Overton window. World, yes, exactly. <laughs> and and not just with regard to platforms, but with regard to publishers. So, for example, this week, NBC News deciding that Rana McDaniel was too much for them. Rana right. McDaniel can't work at NBC News. The sacred halls of NBC News must not be sullied by the former head of the RNC. Jen Psaki, however, can have a show on MSNBC, despite being the press secretary for the White House five seconds ago. Let, let me let me let me just pause because I have a duty as a journalist and just as a person who thinks to correct uh, unfactual information. He's 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 attempting to point out a contradiction here between what happened with Rana and what happened with Jen Psaki. I'm going to play it again because I want you to, hear. to platforms with regard to publishers. So, for example, this week, NBC News deciding that Rana McDaniel was too much for them. Rana right. McDaniel can't work at NBC News. The sacred halls of NBC News must not be sullied by the former head of the RNC. Jen Psaki, however, can have a show on MSNBC, despite being the press secretary for the White House five seconds ago. Right. The, the, the right's response to that is, I think. So if you were to hear what he just said and believe it, you would think that this is a clear act of hypocrisy, right? The White House had a press secretary, Jen Psaki, and she gets to go on NBC with the show, but Ronald McDaniel, who was the RNC chair, gets fired within a few days of getting a job at MSNBC um, because she was the RNC chair. That is hypo hypo hypocr hypocritical. That is hypocrisy. The problem is that's not what happened. He's framing the argument as if Ronna Mc the objection to Ronna McDaniel were based on her status as the RNC chair. If that were the case, she would have not gotten hired. It was no secret that she was the RNC chair. She was one of the most prominent Republicans in the world. The objection from everybody at MSNBC and a growing number of people at NBC when, when she was fired was that she was a election denier. She didn't just run the RNC. She wasn't just the RNC chair. 
there are plenty of Republicans on 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 MSNBC. There are plenty of Republicans who are, Mike, uh, Michael Steele was the RNC chair. Michael Steele was the chair of the RNC, just like Ronald McDaniel, and he has a show on MSNBC in the mornings with Simone Sanders, and with Alicia Menendez. So that ain't the issue. They're all politically tied together. That ain't the issue. The issue is Ronald McDaniel was carrying the water for Trump and, and, and refusing to affirm the electoral victory of a democratically won election. She also was co committing and, and echoing and uh, affirming Trump's lies that the election was stolen, trying to, trying to undermine and undo the results of the 2020 election, presidential election, meaning she was an enemy to democracy. She was an enemy to democracy. So if you're an enemy to democracy, then yeah, they might not want you working on a media platform. That's very different than somebody who just happened to be Republican with the job. And again, that's verified by the fact that there are many Republicans on MSNBC, including someone who had the exact same job as Ronald McDaniel. But let's keep rocking because that's not that's a side point. But Ben was this is this is the misinformation that gets passed as fact. I think correct to say you guys have shut the Overton window too tight, but I think some elements of the right have basically said there is no Overton window. The Overton window should be completely exploded with regard, not just to platforms, with which I kind of agree, but with regards to publishers. So NBC News not only has an obligation to hire Rana McDaniel, NBC News has the obligation to hire Alex Jones, for example. Right. Uh, which I, I which don't just think makes true. no sense at a business level beyond beyond free speech. I mean, there's a reason that networks exist. It, it right. They have, editor they have editorial yeah. positions. Yeah. Daily Wire has a very yeah, strong yeah. editorial position on a wide variety of, of issues. And by the way, I should say that, you know, there are a lot of people who are suggesting this is about disagreements over Israel. I mean, I can safely say it is not about disagreements over Israel to the extent that without reference to Candace at all here, Matt Walsh has taken the position that America ought not be involved in the Middle East at all. Matt Walsh's position, so far as I understand it, and I've talked to him about it, is that Israel, in a conflict between Israel and Hamas, Israel is obviously a more moral party than the genocidal terrorist group Hamas, but also it's very far away. He doesn't care and it doesn't involve America. That's just a pure isolationist position. I disagree with it. I think it's wrong. I think that, that it's short-sighted. But again, he's on our platform. That, that is well within the range of acceptable discourse at the Daily Wire. So you know, the, the notion that you have to mirror my exact perspectives on, on. This is what we call a straw man. He is taking an argument that is weak, that is unsustainable, but also that no one is making and defeating it as if it were the actual argument. Let me be clear. No one ever said that she was fired for having uh, the same, for not having the exact exact mirrored opinion of Ben Shapiro. No one said that. And no one said that there's a singular position that one must have on Israel to work at, um, at the Daily Wire. And he points out this example of Matt Walsh, who's an isolationist, who says, yeah, Israel's better than Hamas, but the US shouldn't intervene in the war. That is a standard right-wing position, sometimes a left-wing position, certainly a libertarian position, um, it's an isolationist position um, that Ben disagrees with, but in that 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 argument doesn't challenge fundamentally the moral or political legitimacy of an ethno state. It doesn't assert that Israel's committing genocide. It doesn't assert that there's an illegal uh, occupation of Palestine. Now, I'm not saying these are Candace Owens' positions. This isn't about Candace Owens for the moment. What I'm saying is Ben acts as if, oh, you don't, as Ben acts as if we're claiming. And by we, I mean critics, that anybody who disagrees with Ben on Israel gets fired. No, no one's saying that. But the problem is that the, as you use it, the Overton window, the the the, the political, the, the window of acceptable political discourse at the Daily Wire, isn't so narrow that you can't have a, a, a sufficient or legitimate critique of Israel. Now, Ben may say this wasn't about Israel at all, and he says this this wasn't about Israel insofar as dot dot dot. What Ben is. What I'm hearing Ben say underneath those comments, this is my interpretation. Everything else, so far I've said is a complete fact. Now I'm going to give you my interpretation of what he just said. I think what he's saying is this isn't about Israel. This is about her being anti-Semitic. This isn't about uh, her asserting that Israel is committing uh, acts that are morally unacceptable. 
And and it isn't about her criticisms of like the Republican congressman who said that there are no innocent people in in uh, Gaza. But it's the other stuff. The problem is they won't say it's the other stuff. They won't affirm that it's the other stuff. They won't own that it's the other stuff. Because if you own that it's the other stuff, then you got to start unpacking it. You got to start talking about it. You got to start asking questions that he doesn't really want to answer. Right. So check out what Ben says here. He's wrong. I think that, that it's short sighted. But again, he's on our platform that, that is well within the range of acceptable discourse at the Daily Wire. So you know, the, the notion that you have to mirror my exact perspectives on, on what Israel is doing in Gaza is obviously not true based on the roster of hosts that we that we currently have. There are a lot of other factors, obviously, at play. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonsense. A lot of other factors at play is what he says. Yeah. Oh, there are a lot of other factors at play. Um, but what you see happening here is Ben is continuing to sprinkle in subtly this notion that whatever Candace did, it's not political and it's not ideological and that she operated outside the boundaries of reasonable discourse. But really, it's reasonable daily wire discourse which is very very narrow it's also very clear that what ben is doing is outside the boundaries of what they agreed upon whatever their separation agreement was candace never said she got fired she never said she quit the ceo never said they got fired never said they quit but variety hollywood reporter media i all these other people started to say that and so it became a kind of dominant narrative that candace got fired because of her anti-semitism not because of her critique of israeli policy not because of a pushback against the IDF or against Netanyahu, but that she did it because of her anti-Semitism. That's what the Daily Wire said. That's what the Daily Wire said. I'm gonna show you, um, I'm gonna show you one of about 700,000 articles uh, that reinforce the point that I'm making, just so you don't think I'm making this up, right? If you look here, at the, at the Washington Post headline here. Candace Owens departs website after anti-Semitic commentary, right? This is what they say. It's a constant, um, in fact, you don't even have to Google Candace Owens and anti-Semitism. All you gotta do is, is, uh, is Google Candace Owens uh, and fired. And they'll tell you why she was fired. They'll give you the reason, you know, and it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Look here, TMZ, when it happened. So we got the Washington Post on the one hand, then you got TMZ on the other, right? These, these are the different extremes. No disrespect to TMZ. Candace Owens fired from Daily Wire over alleged anti-Semitism. So if they have an agreement that they're not supposed to talk about what happened, if the agreement is that they're not supposed to say what happened and they just have a they just have a smooth departure why are all the news outlets saying she got fired for a specific reason why are the news outlets saying that now there have been some leaks that have come up in the last couple of days um and those leaks have shown that there was a press conference held um, a press conference that was held, I'm sorry, a, not a press conference, a town hall meeting held after, oof, after Candace Owens was let go. And they effectively were rounding up the troops in the company to tell them that Candace was fired for anti-Semitism. Again, generating a narrative. Now you might say, Mark, how do you know this? Well, you can, you can do your own search for the email leak, but Candace, Candace Owens herself, Candace Owens herself has been very clear about this position. If you look right here, she tweeted less than a half an hour from the time that I'm recording this right now. In response to the interview we just looked at, Ben, we agreed not to talk about this, but you are very much going on a public tour right now, pretending not to talk about it. Just what I said, while you are very much talking about it, would you like me to do the same? That's the, that's the black girl energy right there. I love it, right? She said, you're acting like you're not talking about it, but you are. 
Would you like me to do the same? So clearly they had agreement not to talk about the departure. They clearly have some kind of non-disclosure or some type of handshake agreement or some type of ex acceptable position uh, that they're not going to talk about what just happened. That's the argument. And yet he's talking about it because it's important for them to send out the message that she didn't quit, but we fired her. And it's important for them to say that we didn't fire her because of a, a distinct uh, policy difference, but because we believe she's an anti-Semite. Now, the question y'all might say is, well, is she an anti-Semite? And that seems like a legitimate question. And in fact, that is a legitimate question. You must always ask that because there are a lot of anti-Semites in the world. And if someone is anti-Semitic and they're articulating anti-Semitic positions, they should be fired. Now, it's a little bit ironic that a right-wing media outlet is that obsessed with this, given how many right-wing anti-Semites there are who get platformed by right-wing sites. Now, I suspect Ben Shapiro doesn't do it as much because I think he's far more thoughtful and careful and nuanced about this issue, at least to the extent that he's not just going to embrace every evangelical Christian that loves Israel but hates Jewish people because he's an Orthodox Jew himself, and I think he takes that seriously. I even watched him criticize uh, Rabbi Shmuley for what he called a kind of obsession with attention, but also performing a certain kind of uh, almost Jewish minstrelsy uh, that he that he that he put you know put on the the, the blood and the, the nose and all this stuff in response to um, uh, Candace Owens. It was a horrible, awful character caricature that if anyone other than a Jewish person did, we would see as anti-Semitic. It's not for me as a non-Jewish person to tell Shmuley how to represent Jewish people, but Ben Shapiro, as a fellow Jew, said he didn't like it. And so that so that's his position, not mine. That's his position. And it's an interesting one. When you think about that, um, when you think about that in relation to uh, what's happening right now, what's happening right now, uh, Candace Owens, friends with Kanye West. Kanye West has said some remarkably, stunningly, disturbingly, disgustingly anti-Semitic uh, statements in the last year. And I know everyone has to this desire to run to his defense, um, to protect him, to shield him, to justify his actions. But it's indefensible what Kanye West has said. Um, Saying that you're going to go, you know, DEFCON 3 on the Jews is stupid and probably anti-Semitic. But if he had said, look, I didn't know what that meant or I misspoke, da 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 it, But it's not one statement. It's, I mean, the man praised Hitler. These are problems. Now, some of you say, well, and hit the like button, y'all, if y'all if are enjoying this conversation, because this is what we need to do to keep the, the algorithms algorithm in. Um... Kanye West is, is indefensible. I agree, Rolando. Uh, Candace also made a statement a couple of years ago about Hitler. It was a strange statement. I've covered it before. We don't need to revisit it. But she basically said in, in, her, ex, in her analysis of nationalism, she said people think about nationalism, they think of Hitler. Um, but Hitler was a globalist. Issue, Hitler's issue was that he was global. Um, and had he just stated Germany wanted to make Germany great, he would have been just fine. That's a rough quote. Now, later on, um, she explained, you know, she tweeted, you know, Hitler was a monster. Hitler was a murderer. I'm not saying I don't support Hitler. Obviously, I don't endorse Hitler. I don't think Candace Owens endorses Hitler. I think it was a terrible statement to make. If she misspoke, she smoke, she misspoke in an awful way. Everybody misspeaks, everybody makes mistakes. I think she was putting too much dip on her chip. I think she was trying to engage in a historical analysis of, um, of what was happening in Germany, as well as a theoretical conversation about nationalism. And I don't think she knew enough about those topics at that point to have that conversation, or uh, she didn't articulate it well. Because if people who agree with you and disagree with you politically, if people on the left and the right, if Jews and Gentiles, Christians and Muslims, if everybody hears that and the overwhelming majority of them hear something anti-Semitic or hear that you praised Hitler, um, then either you are praising Hitler and you're gaslighting us or you misspoke. But let's say we give her the benefit of the doubt and say she misspoke. And I actually am inclined to say that, again, it was an awful statement. 
it was a hurtful statement. But let's be clear, they hired her anyway. So clearly Ben Shapiro, again, you talk about an Overton window, praising Hitler is way outside any Overton window in modern society. So either Ben Shapiro thought that she was an anti-Semite and hired her anyway, or he knew, or at least believed that she was not an anti-Semite at that time. So this is the interesting question. He knew exactly what happened and still hired her. And over the next couple of years, when he stood with Kanye West, or when she stood with Kanye West, wearing White Lives Matter t-shirts, Ben Shapiro ate it up. He loved it. He went on social media and praised it. So again, either you don't think she's an anti-Semite or cynically, you don't care because she was willing to make arguments that supported the right-wing agenda. She was able to make arguments that were uh, anti-Black, in my opinion. She was able to make arguments that were anti-trans. And so if um, it's, it's, a, it's a confusing or complicated assessment that we have to make here, right? What, what, what was his reason? What was his motivation for doing this? And why now was it a bridge too far? Well, she brings Rabbi Barclay on and he calls her an anti-Semite and she calls him to the carpet for an article she wrote. And I gotta say, she got the better of him. Again, there were a few moments where I thought he was right, where he said, hey, you, you know, you called Rabbi Shmuley's daughter a hag. There's a long history of believing that Jews are witches. I believe you didn't know that history, but now that you know it, could you just not do it anymore? Could you just say, hey, maybe I should have used a different word and she, she stood 10 toes on that where I thought she should not have. But when it comes to the many of the other things where he said she made claims that she really didn't make, he said that she attacked Ben Shapiro when she really didn't. She's held her powder this whole time. Now, the question of saying Jesus is king, which I can, I'm going to talk about in a different video, or Christ is king or Jesus is king, there's nothing anti-Semitic about saying Jesus is king or Christ is king. If you're a Christian, you believe that. The question is, if you are using it, to antagonize a Jewish person, or if it is perceived that you are using it to antagonize a Jewish person, we have to think about that language in context. Similarly, I, um, I really like fried chicken. And you might really like fried chicken, my white viewer. And if you say to me, yo Mark, why don't you go home and get some fried chicken? I'm not offended by that. It's not racist. Yo, Mark, get, you want, do you have a taste for chicken, Mark? No. But if we're having a political debate, and then we start talking about race and racism, and we get it gets heated, and right in the middle of it, like, why don't you go eat some fried chicken? Oh, wait. That might be different. And if I say, look, man, I'm just saying you're not respecting my black identity. You're not respecting my my, you know what I mean? You're not affirming my identity as a black person. I feel like you're doing something problematic. And you say, whatever, man, just go eat some fried chicken. Now I'm hearing that different than if we just sitting around the crib. This is my point. Are you with me? Are you with me? Context matters. If there is a history of Jews being smeared and, and blood libeled and saying that they killed Christ. And so just invoking Christ in certain conversations can be problematic. Um, now I'm not saying invoking Christ per se is problematic. I'm saying invoking it when you're talking to a Jewish person after having an antagonistic conversation around Jewish identity. Christ is King asserts a certain kind of Christian superiority in their mind. Sometimes again, no one is saying that it's inherently anti-Semitic. It's contextually anti-Semitic, like the fried chicken point I just made. And so when people see her doing that, or when someone uh, made a comment about about dr a person drinking Christian blood and Candace hit the like button. Oh. That's anti-Semitic. Now, did she hit the like button on purpose? Was she the person? You know, I don't know. 
but she needs to explain that because if someone if someone accuses a Jew of drinking Christian blood, that is explicitly anti-Semitic. And if you hit the like button and you're endorsing that, then you're doing something anti-Semitic. That's just a fact. Um, I think she needs to answer that. She needs to talk about that because that would be anti-Semitic. And so this is the stuff that we should be talking about. But instead, Ben says, I'm not talking about it. But let me tell you why I'm not talking about it. And then he talks about it. He just talks about it on his own terms so that he can elevate an argument that isn't quite true or accurate. He can elevate, elevate and normalize a narrative about Candace that may or may not be true, but doesn't seem entirely true. Um, and no one can call him on it because whenever people ask him a follow-up question, he can go, I said I wasn't going to talk about it. But let me just say this. That's how he moves. Um, and so he's going to keep dragging Candace from show to show, um, asserting his uh, point of view while somebody inside the Daily Wire is, is giving tips to major newspapers, which is why they're telling that story that she was fired for anti-Semitism rather than saying that they separated over political disagreement. These are all the things we got to talk about and think about and build about. But there'll be more because they're not done fighting. And at some point, Candace Owens is going to make a statement. At some point, Stan Candace Owens is going to step up and say, hey, this is my position. This is what I believe. Here is what happened from my perspective. And I don't think Ben Shapiro wants that. So we'll see what happens, y'all. Anyway, thank you all for watching. Uh, hit the like button if you feel what I'm talking about. Hit the subscribe button if you have not subscribe to the channel yet hit that little bell so you can get updates and notifications about whenever we put out new content and if you're so inclined hit the join button become a member of the channel support the content that we make with fresh commentary radical political analysis political education and alternative representations of media we get that by building this channel out by building this platform out we can only do that with your support so hit the join button uh become a monthly supporter of it or you can go right to cash app dollar sign mlhtv M-L-H-T-V. It's the end of the month. It's March 30th, and we got bills to pay. So if everybody watching here right now could just donate $4, not even 5 just $4. If you just went to Cash App and put $4 in, $4 in, we could pay our bills. We could pay for editors. We could get our, our new podcast with Mumia Abu-Jamal out. We could start to uh, get some, uh, uh, so, some new voices on the channel. We could... Uh, put something toward our studio space if everybody just put four a minimum of four dollars if you want to give more we'd love that we'd be grateful but if everybody just did four dollars we'd be good money y'all i appreciate y'all thank you for watching thank you for supporting the mark of my hell official youtube channel i'll see you soon